Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Soul Focused Radio. This is your host, Martin Friedman, and I'm very, very excited, as always, to be joined by our CEO, Barwick Madi Davenport. M, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, Teddy Bear Moses. Good to hear your voice. Good to be on this podcast. Good to be heard. And we want to just thank everybody for listening and supporting the podcast. It's growing tremendously. We love you and we appreciate your support. Yes, yes, absolutely. And today I'm extra excited, my D, because we are getting to talk about a subject that I think has not been talked about nearly enough. And we are going to be doing a whole series on what we call a new man. And we're going to spend about five, six episodes interviewing some guests, talking amongst ourselves about what does it mean to be a man? And what is what has it meant to be a man? And what does it mean to be a man moving forward? How do we want to be as men moving forward? So let's just let's jump into this. And, you know, I want to talk to you about the title of our series, A New Man. You know, what what inspired you to suggest that title, A New Man? Well, you know, when, when I look out at, at the world, at men in the world, and men that I've worked with in my coaching practice and my own, you know, struggles and challenges that I faced as a man. What I saw and see is that most men live their lives not being seen by other people. We hide who we are because of what we've been socialized to believe it means to be a man. And essentially men, we have been socialized to be, to to see ourselves as almost like gladiators, providers, protectors and gladiators. And so, which is why sports is so reverenced in among men, because we have this gladiator mentality that has been socialized into our subconscious programming. And we see ourselves as that. And as the gladiator, it makes it almost impossible for the gladiator to reveal who he is to those who he loves. So oftentimes our children don't know who we are. Our wives don't know who we are. Our family and friends don't know we are, who we are. Rarely do we really expose ourselves. And that creates what I consider this, the old man who doesn't really enjoy his life, doesn't really get to enjoy who he is because he's so busy trying to be what society says he's supposed to be, which means ignoring emotions, ignoring his feelings and, uh, creates a lot of pain. So there's a lot of undealt with, a lot of unresolved trauma and pain that men experience that they never get a chance to talk about. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You know, because I think we don't talk about pain very much, right? You know, we're, we're socialized from a young age to not feel pain. And if we do feel pain, not to show it. And so talk a little bit more about that pain and, and how that pain kind of lingers and sticks around. Well, See, the thing is, too, because I, I would like I like to share like, a, a you know, maybe an episode from my own life. When I say episode and experience, an event that I created an experience from that created a lingering pain that I, I didn't deal with because the socialization about what a man is supposed to be that's given to us by the world is actually ego driven. So it makes us ego first, soul second. And so we mm. most of the cases we ignore what's in our soul to act out of our ego. And I, I remember my first love, right? And when you when you talk about first love, you're talking about something that you have nothing to compare it to. So it, it lands on your heart like real heavy because you're open to it, no comparisons, whatever. And so I, I really loved this woman. We decided we were going to get married once we finished college. She went to one university. I went to another on a football scholarship. We communicated, of course, in long distance relationships are not always easy. But for the most part, you know, we continue to love each other and continue to have the hope that we would one day marry each other. Well, at some point in our relationship, I received a phone call from her saying that, you know, she needed me to marry her, you know, like immediately. And so I was like, why? And she was like, well, you know, because of her religious views, she was, you know, heavy in the church. And, uh, you know, she was taught that it's better to marry than to burn, which is another word of another way of saying, you know, Mm -hmm. It's better to be married and have sex than have sex and sin and you go to hell. 
So she wanted to get married to avoid, you know, being sort of like guilty for having sex outside of marriage. And so I, I reminded her about, you know, what we was agreed to do. And, and she says, well, I have to make a decision. But she didn't tell me what that meant. So me feeling, you know, the conflict in her, I borrowed my roommate's car and I drove back home, you know, skipped all my classes and just drove back home because I was like, you know, real concerned and, you know, for the love I have for her. So I went home. And when I, by the time I made it home, I literally, when I pulled up to my dad and my stepmom's house and I got out of the car, my stepmom was running out of the car to meet me. Now, we didn't have a good relationship, me and my stepmom. So her running out to the car to me, greet me, I knew it was bad news. But before she could tell me what the bad news were, I looked up the street at uh, my my first love's aunt's house where she stayed with her aunt. And she was getting out of the car holding hands with another guy. Mm-hmm. And in that, in that moment, my stepmother said, she says, you know, she tells me, she says, you know, such and such, I want to say her name, just got married to someone else like the day before. Mm. And she says, how do you feel? And in between me not having a great relationship with my stepmother, being a real toxic relationship because she's very manipulative. She really didn't like us because we were from another woman <laughs> it was from mm-hmm. that age. So, mm-hmm. you know, she was just, you know, her way of throwing salt, right? So how, how do you feel? I said to her in that moment, I went ego first. And I said, oh, man, I'm not worried about that. There's so many fish in the sea. I just give me mm-hmm. another one. Mm-hmm. And I completely ignored the devastating, traumatizing pain that I was re- being revisited upon, which was the abandonment, the feel of abandonment and betrayal that I felt I received from my own parents, from my mother and my father. And so it was like a reoccurring pain that was coming back up in a, in a different form, in the form of this betrayal that I experienced from my first love. So you can just imagine how it felt to have to deal with the reality that the person that you love and, and expected to marry is now married to someone else, now going off to live their own life, and you are left with having to deal with, with all those things. And I never got a chance to even talk to her. So it's like somebody dying hmm. and you're not ever getting a chance to have a, a funeral. So that pain lingers in you. And as a man, you know, going along with the program, going along with what it means to be a man, not to cry, not to show emotions, and definitely not to, you know, reveal that you're hurt by this. I would go through torment for years, experiencing like every time I would get into a relationship with a woman and I would begin to start having feelings for her, that pain would come back up. And I would, I remember literally walking the streets some nights by myself, just crying so nobody could see me in mm-hmm. utter total pain. And that would influence me for, for years. So I was this old guy. And when we say new man, I wasn't a new man at that time because I was stuck in the pain of the past and the past kept calling me. So I kept treating the past like it was the present. And so it prevented me from allowing anybody else to see me. I was invisible to myself and to others for a very long time. And it, it, it stoked anger inside of me. If it wasn't for football, I probably would have been in a lot of trouble because football gave me the opportunity to, to release that that rage, release that anger that developed so deeply in me. Yeah, thank you for sharing that story. And one of the things that's really sticking with me is like you didn't have anybody you could talk to about that, did you? No. And nobody, nobody. Your father never sat you down and prepared you and said, no. you know, this might no. happen to you. I'm here for you. You, do, you know, no. I know you were raised around your uncles and we'll talk more about that in future episodes. But you didn't have anybody you could go to to support you. I mean, that no, must have no. felt really lonely, bro. Must it, have was, felt really it, lonely. Was, it was past lonely, you know, because I was ashamed mm-hmm. too. So, you know, being taught what you are taught, what it means to be a man, I was ashamed to even say this had happened to me. Right. You know, because not only did it say that something I, I equated it to something is wrong with me. I mean, this is this is this is a rejection on another level. Mm-hmm. You know, at, later in life when I became the new man, when I transformed into the new man, I realized that it wasn't rejection, it was redirection. She was doing mm-hmm. me a great favor because 
you know, in the in the wash, I see that and saw that we weren't walking the same path, which is not to say anything bad about her, even though, you know, it was painful what she did. But, you know, I wished her the best and whatnot. Once I was able to transform into the new man and stop living in the past. But it was the things that stopped me from transforming into the new man was this idea of being ashamed to to express to other people the hurt and pain that I was experiencing, having no one to talk to, as you talked about, and feeling like I was totally and utterly alone. Mm. I was alone a lot. Even when I was around a lot of people, I was alone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Em. And I share I share that feeling, too. You know, I, I want to share a story, too, that you're helping me to remember. You know, I had when I was a teenager, you know, I had this group of friends and uh, everything pretty much revolved around drugs and alcohol for us. You know, I started uh, smoking weed and drinking it, you know, when I was 12, 13 years old. And so, you know, we're 15, 16, 17 years old and everything is revolving around drugs and alcohol. And, you know, I had a girlfriend in that group you know, it's kind of what brought these groups together. You know, before I was in this group of friends, I felt so isolated and alone too. Really drugs and alcohol were the thing that that got me to be more socially connected to other people, right? But that that loneliness, that intense loneliness, that isolation, there was, you know, when I broke up with my girlfriend, there was a, a, a good friend of mine in that in that friend group who I had a pretty big crush on, you know? And one night, you know, her and I were drinking and and probably I think we were on some drugs too, well, I know we were actually, I think Quaaludes. And, you know, she, we started messing around, you know, you know, and, and she, she asked me to kiss her and, you know, it was, it was a whole thing. Like, and I was sprung, <laughs> you know, I didn't have the word sprung as a, as a white <laughs> middle class teenager in the, in the late seventies, but uh, early eighties, but I was sprung. And, um, and, you know, basically, you know, we made out and we're like, oh, you know, we basically talked like we were going to hook up and it was like a dream come true. Like I went to sleep thinking she's going to be my girlfriend and she was beautiful. I had a huge crush on her. So I call her the next day, like she's my girlfriend and she's like, yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. She goes, yeah, come over. Let's talk about everything. So I get over there and she had one of her girlfriends there with her, you know, which I wasn't expecting. And basically, you know, what she told me in front of her friend, she had her friend there to support her was that, you know, that was all just drug induced, you know, Mm -hmm. it wasn't real for her, you Mm -hmm. know, and it was crushing. Mm -hmm. I would, I would use the terminology crushing because I walked over there like skipping, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like I was on cloud nine, like, you know, I was so excited for this relationship and I walked back, like I was in three feet of mud, you know, dragging my feet and I had no, I never, I've actually never told this story to anybody before, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, I've carried the story with me Um, later on, you know, her and I, we became very good friends. So when you talk about redirecting her and I had a very powerful friendship uh, that where we both supported each other through a lot of turmoil later on in life. Had we gotten together in that moment, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I know for sure, because I was emotionally a child, you know, we all were. And, you know, completely in my addictions around drugs and alcohol. I know we, we would never have been friends like we became friends and we're still friends to this day. Right. So as you say, so it's like holding both things, right? So if I had had somebody in my life to say, you know, just to talk me through it, but there was no man I could turn to, there was no woman I could turn to and talk about how crushed I felt. I just, I had to sit in that isolation. I had to sit in that sadness. And actually, you know, for me, I just got, I just got drunker and higher. That's how I dealt with it. Did you, you did know? you experience some of that what I experienced, which was, you know, being becoming trapped in that moment. So for years to follow, I was literally trapped in that moment. You know, it's like if, you know, like imagine you're called into the office, you got a job, those of you who are listening, and you you're called into the office and your boss chews you out and you want to defend yourself, but you don't say anything. I mean mm-hmm. And when you walk out, you walk out of the out of the office, you feel so bad. You feel you feel bad because you feel like you betrayed yourself. You didn't defend yourself. And then so what happens is you, you know, to try to like relieve yourself from that moment to escape the moment, you maybe call a friend and you tell a friend the opposite of what actually happened. You tell them what you wanted to tell your boss, but didn't. 
because you just, you know, you just ate everything that you wanted to say for the sake of saving your job or whatever. And so you live stuck in that moment, like rehashing that moment over and over again, going over it in your mind about how could, how you could have done it different, how the moment would have been different if you would have just said what you really want to say. Well, you know, in those instances, like your situation, Martin, and mine, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to, you know, I couldn't call a friend, you know, like, right. you know, right. you're on the line, you want to call a friend, you a dollar <laughs> yeah. friend for them. There was no friend right, I right. could call. And, right. you know, there was absolutely no way for me to talk to her because she would never make herself available for me to understand what caused her to do. And then, you know, I felt the betrayal had to have been gone on a long for a while because you don't just get married to a perfect stranger. That's right. You know, so I had to deal with all of that, just like you had to deal with filling in the blanks yourself. At least you had an explanation, you know, where she said, you know, she was, you know, it was drug induced which I'm right. pretty sure was very painful because that was another way of saying, you know, I would, I wouldn't be with you. I wouldn't have been with you if I was, you know, in my clear head, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And I was just as, I was just as high and drunk as her. And I woke up clear headed the next day, like this is on. Right. So let me just say a couple of things about, you know, to answer your question. Yes. Trapped in that moment in two different ways. A couple of years later, I tried to get with her again. You know, we were both getting therapy and getting ourselves right. And, you know, Clearly, we loved each other and we were very close. And she just, you know, she basically just said, and, and I think I think I was still looking for resolution. I had never resolved that moment. I didn't have anybody to talk to about it. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. And I maintained a friendship with her. And I think I was still trying to resolve that moment. So basically, she said, no, you know, I'm, I just, I love you as a friend. That's it. I guess what, we didn't have friend zone in those days, but I guess that's what it would be. Like, you know, you're in the friend zone and you're going to stay there, right? Yeah. You, know, you know, we didn't have that terminology. So it was never resolved for me. And then I had two situations later in my life where I played that out again. And mm -hmm. the main way that I would say that I was trapped in that moment is that it became a repetitive pattern where I attracted women who would do versions of that. There was a woman in college who we were real tight same thing, messed around a lot. And then um, she ended up having sex with one of my closest friends in my apartment when I was passed out, you know, wow. uh, found that out later, attracted that. My first like real girlfriend where we lived together, we were together two or three years. She, you know, getting with this guy that was supposed to be her friend. I was the only one that didn't know, you know, and those are two situations. And the one thing I used to always say to her is just tell me, like, if this is over, I'm cool. To be honest with you, I, I know I attracted both of those relationships. I attracted people that would ultimately kind of break my heart. Right. And so that so that being trapped in that moment in many ways meant repeating patterns. And I had to do some pretty good work to the next person I got with. We didn't have that dynamic anymore. You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I, but I, but I trapped in that moment for sure. For yeah, sure. I could definitely relate because when you when you trapped in that moment, you know, and you could be trapped in a moment consciously and subconsciously. But then it, what keeps you trapped in a lot of ways is the fact that there is a socialization about what it means to be a man that, yes. that doesn't allow you to, you know, well, the old man, it doesn't allow the old man to reveal himself. That's you know, right. so you're walking around basically like a time bomb with all of these unresolved emotions and anger uh, that is built up from your relationships, not just with women, but from other men uh, sometimes in life. And you don't talk about it. You know, you know, you could you could go fight another guy. Society says that's OK. You could go, you know, compete with another guy. That's OK, yes. you know, but to to peel back the onions of, you know, the scars and, and, and trauma that you've experienced as a man, you know, in society is like it's a no, no. Right. Which is I think that's yeah. the reason why most guys are homophobic is not yeah. just the sexual thing. It's more of the emotional thing and the idea of a man demonstrating or expressing his real emotions and letting people see his what, what the world would call weaknesses. Right. Right. I remember I was in a relationship where, you know, I'm a very positive guy and usually I'm focused in high energy. And on this particular day, I was feeling rather depressed and I couldn't put my finger on why I was feeling that way. And, you know, when I expressed to the woman that I was in a relationship with, I said, you know, 
feeling kind of depressed today. I mean, it was like an explosion happened. What? Not you. I can't believe how are you depressed? And it was gone. She went on and on and on and on. And I was like, oh, shit. I can't be myself with this woman. Mm. I have to continually put wear this cape that I've been having on. I can't be just a regular guy. I can't be the guy who, you know, who has pain, who has highs and lows, who struggles with things. I, I can't be that with her because she sees me in a, in a certain way and I can't be the way that I really am. So that, that let me know that I was living like that for, for, for many relationships that I was in where you know, I wasn't giving them a chance to see me because I wasn't giving myself a chance to see me. You know? Yeah, I think that's really powerful. I think when I think about what it means to be a man in the old sense or the old man, you know, it's hard for me to say old man, my D, because, you know, I'm 58 and I'm like an old man. I'm a new old man, but I'm getting to be an old man. So we're talking about when we say old man, we're talking about old ways of being. Well, right. It has nothing to do with age, being, right? Definitely the old way of being, men in the old way of being and men in the new way of being. Maybe that's even more, yes. you know, yes. more appropriate. Because when I remember when I was going through my training, my my spiritual development training, uh, my teacher would say to us that man means mind. And you could be a man regardless of what your sexual orientation was. And he was one of the first people you know, my spiritual teacher is one of the first people to introduce that concept to me, the idea that man is mine and you could be male or female and be a mind, be a man, right? What it meant was a stable mind, a stable mind, a mind that had direction and purpose. And before you became a man, you could become, you could be a woman, a wo- like the womb, like you're developing your mind and you could be male or female. That was his take on it, right? His perspective. So when we say old man, I mean old mind, the old mind, the old way of thinking, the old way of being has not been very, very healthy. We look at our society and our society is filled with problems. We are being, we are drowning in problems because of the old way of thinking, the old mind. Yes. Yes. We need a new mind, a mind that solves the problems in our, in our lives. A mind that creates, not just fights and destroys, but builds and encourages. We need a new mind. We need a mind that's not afraid to love for real. And I'm not talking about the love that we sing about and talk about all the time because people say love all the time. You know, the guy who says he loves the woman is beating her up physically, but he says he loves her. The woman who's cheating on the man says she loves the man, but she's cheating on the man. We don't know what love is, to be honest with you, as a result of hiding who we are. We really don't know. Love is just a damn word. Right. It has become just a word until we really understand how to reveal ourselves and we start sharing who we really are with people. That's when we really discover what love really is. Until then, we just it's just a word. And people use the word right. all the time. So what I'm really hearing you say, and I'm thinking about your, your stories and my stories, is that the you know, the old way of being the old man, you know, the old way of being a man is really, it's really ego. It's all about comparison. It's all about power over. Right. Because, you know, one of the things that as you were talking, I was thinking about a lot of, a lot of the struggle for me in my life has been how much of a man are you? You know, Mm. the, the stories that I told you made me feel less of a man. Right. And, you know, just thinking about how ego plays that out. So my whole life, like, am I enough of a man to be okay? You know, um, my sexuality, I've always been straight, you know, heterosexual. That's not been an issue. And I also carry feminine energy with me, too, you know. And and, and, I was a sensitive child. So, you know. Yeah, me too, bro. Me too. Their interpretation of my sensitivity was feminine, you know. Exactly. Exactly. And I remember I took that test, the Minnesota multiphasic personality test or whatever, and I scored real high on the feminine energy, you know, on the intuition and the and the uh, emotion and the sensitivity. And that part was I was always told I was too much of those things. I didn't come from a family. You know, my father wasn't this super macho person, but I was never I was never told that it was okay how sensitive I was, how in touch with my emotions I was. And so I got the message early on that when I was those things, 
I wasn't enough of a man. And well, that, you, that old way of being, you know, that's that old way of being a man to me is that you're right. always constantly being in measurement against yeah. other against other men. Well, you've heard me the talk standard. about this. Yeah, yeah, you've heard me talk about this before, uh, the story about my father. My father never told me he loved me. Never. Right. right. And, you know, it, it's so profound because when you, if you met the man, you would see that he was a gentleman, but who he had to be to survive racism, to survive even even patriarchy, because patriarchy imposes upon a male a certain yes. certain set of way of thinking and being that the society then holds you accountable to acting in that way, not just other men, but women too. So women are socialized to see men in a certain way. And so the men, the women are holding the men accountable for being what they are socialized to be, even though it's killing them, even though it's keeping them paralyzed from showing up as their self, so much so that a father would never tell his oldest son that he loved him mm. because he was so caught up in the, the, with the box or the context of patriarchy. And, and, and demonstrating what it means to be hard, what it means to be tough, what it means to not give up, which, is, you know, it's, it's a good thing to have grit and not give up and be tough. But it, when it's at the expense of you losing your heart. Right. It's that's powerful. And that's what we're saying, that love, the new man is love. You know, there's a quote, a bell hooks quote that that, you know, my wife and some people that she was in doing trainings with around patriarchy, as well as racism and sexism. And the bell hooks quote says the first act of violence that patriarchy demands of males is not violence toward women. Instead, patriarchy demands of all males that they engage in acts of psychic self mutilation, that yes. they kill off the emotional parts of themselves. Yes. And that's what we do. That's what we have done. That's what the old man has done. The old way of thinking. That's a, it's a ritual. The ritual is to, you have to kill that part of you that's sensitive, that part of you that feels, that part of you that uh, empowers you to connect to others, that part of you that allows you to be empathic. You have to kill it. It's a ritual. Right. And we're saying the new man is we can't afford to participate in this ritual. We have to we have to give ourselves and our children the opportunities to see who we really are so they can live a real life and not a life that's based in falsities. Where you're pretending to be something that you're not, where you're trying to please people, trying to rather than fulfilling the desires of your heart, rather than being soul first. So a new man is really being a soul first leader, putting mm -hmm. soul first. And, mm -hmm. and that requires a new programming, a new socialization. We have to re-socialize ourselves. We can't keep going off of the same program and expect to end up being a new man. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, the, the good news, right? The good news is we're saying, if you look at that Bell Hooks quote, she says it's psychic self-mutilation to cut off that part of ourselves. But the good news is, is that we can regrow that part. It's not like it's not gone forever. Right. Our emotions aren't actually gone. They're not actually cut off, but our emotions are actually still here, like just buried, just waiting for us to to bring them out. It's all. It reminds me of the movie Get Out, right? Remember the right. movie Get Out and they had the sunken place. Right. And our emotions are in that sunken place for many of us yeah. as men. Yeah, and our emotions are observing us, you know, observing us from that sunken place, but waiting to be freed and to be liberated and to come out. And that's what we're saying to new man. We're saying that, you know, less of a man and more of a man. What we're saying now is that the new man, to be more of a new man, you have to be vulnerable. You have to lead with love. You have to show your emotions. Um, you have to be authentically who you are and lead with that instead of leading with this hard veneer. And that's why it's that act of self-violence that has made us so violent out in the world towards women and also towards other men. Yeah. And ultimately, I, because we, we perpetuate that violence against ourselves and then we're we're so disconnected. Now we're violent in the world all the time. You know, our wounds in a lot of in most cases, you know, well, our childhood traumas are not inflicted by ourselves but what happens is that childhood trauma is not dealt with because of the program that comes along with being a man and what's etc cetera, etc cetera. so from that point on what we experience is self-inflicted wounds we keep mm -hmm. you know mutilating ourselves 
And when we blame it, we project it onto other people and it, it creates this anger, this hostility, this loneliness, this isolation, you know, this ice. We see we feel isolated even in our own homes. You know, they say men are very simple. We all, we want simple things. That's not true. The reality is we have we have simplified ourselves to that point because we've cut off so much of our nuance. Our nuance is coming from our emotions and our feelings and from those parts of ourselves that we have been taught to mutilate. So that's why we all come off as simple. But Father's Day, you get a, a tie. You don't really want a damn tie. You want more than a damn tie. You that's you right. want to, you know what I'm saying? You want to be, you know, spoiled. But men aren't spoiled because what? We say we don't want very much, but it's because we've settled for little. Yes. The man as the old man in the old way of being is this gladiator way of, gladiator way of being. Of course you don't want nothing. You want to just be alone. You want to be sitting down by yourself on the couch watching some damn game because mm-hmm. you it's your it's your therapy, your way of escaping, dealing with your own emotions that and the world is calling for you to come out. We need a new man to come out and be fully who you are, not just a small portion, small piece of who you are. That's all we've been experiencing, a small piece of each other. You just really put something together for me, uh, and, and what you put together for me is the idea that the, one of the reasons why we like to be alone so much is because that's the only time we really feel like we can be truly who we are. Yes. Because when we're around other people, and I'm thinking about, so I'm around women a lot in my life right now. And, you know, just recently, you know this, but just recently I got to drive up the coast from Florida to New York, right? Because we're, right. we're, we have a place up here in Brooklyn now, right? As you know, I know you, I know you know, because I know you're excited for, for me yes. and for us. Yes, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, my family, my wife and, and and our daughter, they were both like, oh, I bet you're excited to drive, to be by yourself. And I really was. And I'm just putting it together now. You know, there's some issues that have come up. So I have to go back home to Florida. I'm going to be by myself for about a week. And I was looking forward to it again. And what I'm realizing is that it's kind of exhausting to be around people who are really in touch with their emotions all the time and want me to be in touch with my emotions all the time. And I'm a, I'm way on the emotional scale for most men and it still feels exhausting. And I think the reason why I want to be alone is so that I can just shut down that side of me and be okay with it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And I, it's, you know, that's why I think we want to be alone so much because it still feels like a demand to be vulnerable, to yes. be open. It does and, feel like that. And I am those things, I would say, way, way high on the scale. And still, it can be exhausting for me sometimes to be around anybody, but especially the women in my life who are so emotional, emoting all of the time. It changes, it switches, it's in the moment. That's what I realized, like the old man in me that still exists is like, well, if we were just in one place just like 10 minutes ago, why aren't we still in that place? You're you're in a new place now because right. you're living in the moment. It's like, like what the fuck? I like we, you know, I thought we were at this one place and now we're in this other place. And that's that could be exhausting for me. It's, to, it's, it's challenging. To be, to, you know, it's challenging yeah, to us. It's, it's challenging to an ego who that is uh, uh, emotional illiterate. Right. Our ego yeah, is like, emotionally illiterate. I like Our that terminology. Ego. See, yeah. you, know, you know, the female ego is not emotionally illiterate because that's the socialization. She's she's OK to be emotional. Right. But for the male ego, you know, we are not socialized to be OK with our emotions. So we, you know, we become illiterate, emotionally illiterate. And so the growth opportunities that men are missing out on is really leaning into their emotions in a way to understand them because they are highly intelligent. They help teach us about our feelings and our feelings are the language of our soul. So our language, our soul speaks in the language of our feelings, but we can't understand our feelings if we don't study our emotions. So mm-hmm. if, if we increase our emotional intelligence, oh my God, the new man could create a whole new world. So that thereby everybody's living into it gets an opportunity to really be who they are. Mm-hmm. We are so afraid. We are so fear based because we are emotionally illiterate that, you know, fear is the, is the, is the most is the probably the greatest emotion we experience. You mm-hmm. know, fear, anger, 
rage. Yes. Hostility. We live in that as men. So the idea of being alone, as you said, gives us an opportunity to come down mm. from that, you know? Yes. And most of the time when we're alone, we do numbing behavior. You yes. Know? We'll, we'll do football. things and numb ourselves out. Football, you know? football, drinking, porn, you know, all that stuff. That's all That's all for us to numb those feelings, the fear. The problem is when you numb the fear feelings, you're numbing all your feelings at the same time. You can't selectively numb feelings. So and, and with, the thing you know, is the hurt and the pain, too, along with the fear. You know, when you, anger is hiding fear, anger is a mask as a disguise for fear. Right. What right, we're doing yeah. is we never, we never question why are we, what are we afraid of? Right. Because when we really question what are we afraid of, then when we discover that we have really been afraid of ourselves, our true selves, and what life would be like if we were brave enough to show up as our true selves in the face of other men in the face of men who are really stoked in the patriarchy's programming to still show up as who we are totally. Mm. That's really powerful. And, you know, I, 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 this makes me excited, my D like I'm excited for this conversation. I know we're, this series is, is something I think I've been waiting for my whole life without even knowing it. You know, because this is an opportunity the new for us to step out as the new men that we are becoming, right? That we are becoming these new men and we want to, we don't want to be isolated and hidden anymore. We want to be seen, uh, not, you know, valued because of, you know, how much money we have or how good we are at this sport or, or anything like that. But we want to be seen uh, as really all who we are, flawed and emotional and yes. and everything. And that's, that's, it's exciting to be able to, to really step out and just show the world this is who we are as new men. I want men and women to know that men have feelings too. And we 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 hurt inside emotionally. We we experience betrayal. We experience those things and it hurt us just as much as it hurts a woman. But we live in a world where everybody is being socialized to not see it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have been put pressure on us to not share it. Like the shame that I felt from, I was betrayed and I felt ashamed to share that I was betrayed. Hmm. I mean, can you imagine walking around with that for years? The shame to just, just express that you were betrayed. Right. But I was supposed to be strong. And that meant not saying a goddamn thing. It was like being violated mm. and not being able to say a thing. That's right. And then, as you said, we then carry that with us. Yes. And and it, it we become emotionally stunted. Yes. Because of these messages that we get. So, yeah, I just want to thank you for this conversation. Um, Likewise. I really enjoy myself, man. Really enjoy myself. And like I say, I cannot tell you how excited I am for us to embark on this series. Um, it's going to be, it's gonna be awesome. 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 A new frontier, a new frontier. Absolutely. For us, for us, 100%. It's a it's a brand new frontier. So we just want to thank all of you. We want to let you know that we do love each and every one of you. We are leading with love. We are, we are, that is part of us being new men is that we are leading with love. We have love for each and every one of you. We are excited beyond beyond expressing, beyond the ability to express ourselves, we are excited to have you on this journey with us. And we can't wait for you to uh, to join us as we you know, embark on this path and all the paths that we're embarking on. Please come to soulfocusgroup.com. Check out everything we're offering. More and more things are going to be offered uh, every day. I listen to all of our podcasts on any podcast platform that you, that you want to listen to. Uh, my dear, is there any last thing you want to say before we close out? No, uh, just I just want to thank everybody again for just being such a wonderful support to this message, because for all of us, it's more like, uh, you know, some people call it a ministry, but it's a calling, mm-hmm. a purpose for us to share this. We're not, you know, like raining down on anybody saying that we know stuff that everybody else does don't know. We're saying that we're mm-hmm. sharing with our, how our life has unfolded and the joy, the pain and the triumph 
that comes with learning to be and stand up for who you really are, regardless of what the world thinks. All right, everybody out there, we want you to stay safe. We want you to stay well. And most of all, we want you to stay soul focused.